Welcome. Thank you for joining us today and spending a bit of your morning with us. We're broadcasting live from Park City, Utah, where I am. Uh, Dill, I think you're in California. And Nick, you're in Arizona, back in Arizona. Absolutely. Yes, right? yes. So uh, again, thank you for joining. We have a bunch of folks coming on today. Uh, big, big fat thank you to Adil, who you can see here, who kindly introduced me to Genius X and uh, their founders, who you'll have the opportunity to meet today. Uh, Lyle will be joining us shortly. We can't hear or see you, except that we know you're there. We encourage you to ask your questions through the chat box in the Q&A. Uh, please post them as they come to mind, simply because we have a lot of folks and we will get to as many as possible. Um, super excited to have you guys. Um, we'll be recording this and uh, posting it with uh, Nick's permission to the Family Office Insights YouTube channel, but at, perhaps at some point we can post it uh, somewhere where they can find more about Genius X as well. So as you um, uh, view our conversation today, if there's anybody that comes to mind that might benefit from hearing what you hear today, uh, the door's wide open and you're welcome to connect directly and we'll make sure that that happens. Um, we'll be doing a series of these because there's a lot of stuff to unpack here. Today is uh, a conversation with Nick, Lyle, and Adil about what Genius X is up to and, and why it's important. So with that, thank you all for being here. Um, again, don't forget to post your questions so we get to as many as possible. Um, and Nick, you want to take it away? Sure. Uh, so my name is Nick Janicki. Um, Ancestry is a Polish guy, so I'm pretty good at making some pierogies if anybody's interested in that recipe. But uh, my background, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. I started in 2009. Uh, with a concept called uh, sensory deprivation. So we started a, a company called True Rest. Rest is an acronym for Restricted Environmental Stimulus Therapy. Uh, and the idea at the time, I had a meditation background. Uh, I've been doing a, a meditation practice for 22 years, Falun Dafa, that's actually banned in China by the CCP. But I went and tried my first float uh, after watching Joe Rogan talk about it, and my senses were revived. I was in a better mood at that time. There were only 14 centers in the North American continent that offered flotation therapy, one in Canada and 13 in the United States. Uh, and this was around 2009. So my wife and I did the typical entrepreneur thing. I went to her and said, hey, can we max out all of our credit cards, take all the money out of our 401k and go in massive debt to start a business no one's ever heard of? And she said, yeah, that sounds great. And I'm paraphrasing the conversation quite a bit. But basically, uh, we were able to start the True Rest Float Spa in 2009. We grew that to 550,000 gross at a 55% net, which is actually pretty mind boggling for a mom and pop shop and certainly mind boggling for franchising. Uh, so in 2014, I had started a manufacturing company uh, to actually sell the pods. And then we actually started franchising the concept and we're still in the high teens, mid twenties on our nets. Um, and we grew that my, my moonshot at the time was to have a million people float, which we actually accomplished in 2022, which is actually pretty amazing. And, um, at that time, uh, you know, we grew very quickly. We have about 50 locations open in 22 States, hundred locations sold, uh, that market cap for that company is about 20 million. Uh, and then when COVID hit. Uh, my daughter went into Zoom school. It was absolutely atrocious the way the education system responded to COVID. Uh, she was nine years old. She's still about a year behind in uh, reading, uh, but she's catching up um, with, with extra help. And at that time, uh, I partnered with Lyle, who's on the call, and Joe Polish. And we really said, okay, how can we redefine how education is happening? So I stepped away from that role full time and became the CEO and co-founder of Genius X. Um, and really we, we, the goal was to say, okay, how can we redefine this? So we started our first app, uh, retreat, uh, which is basically a virtual reality education company. Think of it as a master classes in virtual reality. Uh, as we'll go through this conversation, I won't get into the details of that. Um, we'll, we'll follow up later, but then, you know, we, here we are now. So in the middle of our series seed, we've raised 3 million of eight, and we're looking to really partner with some of these bigger companies like Magic Leap, which we're already partnered with, Meta. We got a 400K uh, grant from Meta's Immersive Learning Fund. 
and we are one of the fastest greenlit apps in their ecosystem. So uh, that's a little bit about uh, me and my background, and we'll uh, take it off to Lyle. Awesome. Thanks for your patience, guys. Um, yeah, so my background, uh, initially, I was actually starting a creative agency for music festivals. Um, I did that with Live Nation, Insomniac, a variety of very large 100,000 person plus events, um, which led me to actually uh, creating and, and curating a biohacking slash neurohacking lounge that toured around the world called the Quantum Lounge. Um, and this exposed me to the variety of wellness technologies that I got very, very passionate about quickly, um, which led to co-founding a VR publishing company called Andromeda Entertainment. Um, this company is actually doing uh, really well now. Um, of course, go figure after you as a founder stepped down from the company. Um, we went from publishing three uh, VR titles uh, while I was there for the first about year and a half to two years to now we're at about 17 uh, it's one of the more prominent VR publishers in the space, and that was really what our intention was. Um, and it's all around games for good, so creating a positive mind-body effect um, or E for everyone type of, of experiences, which the VR market heavily needs. Um, so from that, uh, Nick and I started to have conversations. Nick actually came on as, a, as an advisor for the company as we were looking at building out our own version of a wellness pod. Um, and Nick being the pod guru, uh, it, it only made sense. Um, and, uh, kind of in that time we were incubating a product called sound self, which was a, uh, a very, very new market called digital therapeutics, which is FDA approved video games. Um, so we actually created a spinoff company from Andromeda to focus on sound self as IP, um, under Entheo digital, which is a fully medical focused B2B, uh, clinician driven experience that, uh, is doing a lot of clinical research. Um, and then as Nick has his own story with COVID, uh, mine was as COVID hit, uh, my, my partner, um, she is, is very big in e-learning. Um, she has a variety of, of large e-learning courses and does that very successfully. And as I started seeing that explode during COVID and, and that industry continue to climb, I realized that there was a lot of holes to fill, um, that it was, it was very passive, boring, stale, in my opinion, um, everything was evergreen and um, not really high production quality. Um, and the industry just really needed a lot of experiential, personalized touch. Um, and of course, education is uh, one of those industries that just didn't bounce back from COVID and also was already on a very steep downhill slide um, prior to that happening. So um, Nick and I got together to create this company. So is, is it okay with you guys if Adil says hi real quick? Because he's created the nexus of connectivity here. Of course. Yeah. It's an honor to be with you guys. I, I won't go into my full background, but I, I you know, with my experience, uh, well, geez, so since 20, uh, 2008 actually has been in um, uh, immersive learning and specifically filmmaking and uh, transformational storytelling with Elevate Films and then uh, we'd created a uh, immersive uh, media experience with something called Resonate Creative Labs. So we created a holosphere that was traveling with kind of like 360 degree projections and um, hol holophonic audio and vibroacoustic seating. It's kind of where I first got involved in, uh, in, in the kind of immersive learning space. Um, fast forward to uh, um, basically Unify and uh, we've been creating, we started a global synchronized meditation in uh, 2012. And it was televised in, geez, I think we had about a thousand locations around the world at that time. Um, but but uh, it, it was like a TV show we'd put together on uh, on December 21st, 2012. I don't know if any of you were there present to that um, experience that was happening all, all over the planet. Um, at, you know, generally at sacred sites like uh, Chichen Itza and Palenque and Tikal and um, all through Egypt. So we, we all, all these locations where there's uh, this, uh, people are engaged in, in a like either putting together a meditation or a transformational event and we just unified them all at the same time um, and produced a TV show with that and, and that we continued with that, uh, you know, doing that on Earth Days and Peace Days and World Water Days and um, yeah, they, we grew to sometimes having over 100 million people uh, join for these global meditations and I think we've done about 117 of them now. And um, so it's a big meditation kind of conscious audience and um, 
immers immersive learning, especially as it, as it pertains to transformational content has been very big in our audience. We launched a course called Storyteller um, and uh, as more as a pilot or as a test to see what would happen with the audience. Um, and that was it during COVID and it went nuts. <laughs> so, but to, you know, our, uh, to Lyle's points, it was not, uh, I mean, it's kind of, a, the marketing was awesome. It may be the, uh, some of the course material was fun, but you know, you really lose that, um, that deep interactivity or the experience of being with a, with your fellow students going through an immersive learning experience, sharing insights and understandings. And so, um, as I began to understand what, Nick and Lyle were creating, I'm like, this is so resonant and aligned um, in so many ways. And given that they'd created already 26 courses, I'm, you know, I thought, geez, we should, we should parlay this to our audience. They're going to love it. So I guess that's partly why I'm here. I was all up in Arthur's ear about it. Uh, Cause I think these, I think Nick and Lyle are really onto something. And so with that, I'll just, uh, yeah, I appreciate, appreciate being here. You're muted, Arthur. I see that. Uh, thanks. Uh, just for the record, uh, uh, Adil and I have known each other for quite some time. And what uh, happened is that we were in Egypt and um, uh, Adil uh, got a message from us, shot out from the pyramids to, said he should, to say we should um, reconnect with meaning. And then he also should go to Egypt, which is exactly what he did. And also for the record, I'm gonna put it here, recorded that we met in Egypt, maybe, you know, a thousand years ago. So uh, that, that, that we pretty are convinced of happening. So um, thank you, Adil. Thanks, thank you for sharing. Uh, so Nick, you wanna sort of, start things out with uh, what exactly you're doing with Genius X? Yeah, absolutely. I think the easiest way to understand it is as, um, you know, artificial intelligence is becoming more prominent, as XR is becoming more prominent. Uh, I don't know if people saw the Apple headset release, um, but what's happening is there's going to be, and there's more competition every day into this kind of immersive landscape. And so what you're seeing is potentially a full rewrite of how education works. And this was our mission when we started Lionize and I is going, okay, how do we actually revise this process of, you know, being 17, 18 years old, getting a GED, you know, what technology can essentially do is enable you to have personalized learning with AI. And I'll give you just a broad example. So right now in social media, um, everything's essentially used to manipulate you for advertising. That's kind of the model. And so Lyle and I talk kind of endlessly about these addiction loops that happens in social media. And what we would rather create is basically connection loops. So there's a professor at Stanford, his name is BJ Fogg, and he says the opposite of addiction is connection. And for us, connection is community, right? And so the idea is, can we have a tech company that starts with the moral values that starts with the intrinsic desire to actually help and facilitate the ascension of intellect and the ascension of character and the ascension of spirit and embed that into a technological company. Usually technology progresses for the sake of progress, but we really wanted to have something that's a use case that's proving that this can be helpful for students and teachers simultaneously. So as I mentioned before, our first product was Retreat, which we launched in re record time. Our company has only been uh, we we were in, conceived essentially 29 months ago. We already have a product in the Oculus store. We basically launched in April and are generating subscribers to that product. And so what we're developing now is basically an ecosystem to basically be the middleware for anything that's educational. So the next uh, giant leap for us, we think we're going to do about a million and a half, two million in revenue in the next two months excuse me, in the next 12 months through uh, that consumer market. Uh, and then we're building now an enterprise test case for Magic Leap, where we're actually redefining training. And so the idea here would be, okay, uh, a use case, I'll use the float spas, because that's my background. You can now put a headset on someone working at a float spa, someone working at an in and out burger. Imagine any franchise on the planet. You put a headset on, the trainer can now say, hey, we'll see you in two hours. And the AI avatar, custom trained, can now talk to that person, practice with that person, iterate everything, 
and um, basically save you know 80 percent of a trainer's time uh, in in that process. So I know someone um, that basically tours around the country, uh, 80 percent of their their time, and they're missing their family. And this is now a tool they can utilize to save some of that time. So it's it's really a disruptor, but at the same time, it's extraordinarily helpful when in retail there's just a constant turnaround. You know that's something retail is essentially begging for right now is a tool that can take over some of that training. So those are our two big verticals in the next kind of 12, 12 to 18 months, Arthur. So in, in the corporate training uh, environment is aside from being able to train people and save time and make it customized, uh, has there been a disconnect because all these devices have been available and is the adoption not happen for a specific reason? Was it content? What is it? What is, what is it that has caused them not to use these VR glasses, for example, uh, in training up to this point? Is it the middleware thing? I just asked you a bunch of questions. Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, yeah. I'll answer and then I'll have Lyle jump in as well. Uh, but from from my perspective, uh, there's never been the time where um, hardware and software have intersected. Uh, and so one of the biggest uh, things that people probably heard of was kind of chat GPT. And it's really that personalized learning. And this is only, you know, chat GPT four is literally months old at this point. Right. And so we we were able to go to the Magic Leap headquarters. We were the only ISV partner invited there and give a presentation on the intersection between these AR devices um, and uh, you know tr AI learning, essentially customized learning, and so it's it's basically that those two things have never been able to emerge. So everyone's heard of Microsoft Hololens, which was kind of a bust, and it's because there was no content. And so the key with a lot of these hardware companies is they're actually not content creators; they rely on companies like us that to build these use cases. And a lot of our employees are from the education industry, not the technology industry. So there's a lot of things that have to go into it um, to really make it work. But uh, Lyle, I'll have you jump in as well. Yeah, I would just say, well, outside of the intersection of AR and AI being both very, very new industries and people still discovering how, how that will apply to specific use cases, um, there's also the advent of a variety of things in our tech stack, um, including things like meta humans, voice cloning, uh, biometric analysis, uh, a variety of things that are still very, very new. Um, so we're, you know, starting to create a, a very sophisticated uh, stack of technologies that it's just it's just new enough to where they haven't been put together yet. Um, I also think that Nick and I have a very unique approach because we have been working in the consumer market the last couple of years. I've been in the VR industry for eight years uh, and just understanding the landscape, understanding what is possible and what's needed now versus uh, a lot of companies trying to predict what's happening in the next three to four years. We're really uh, addressing problems that need to be solved um, today, which is uh, lending to, I, I think, us having a, a very unique um, outlook. And, and yeah, I mean, legitimately combining some of these companies and having them go on the, you know, meet us on the on a conference call to talk with our tech team to figure out uh, a variety of development uh, needs. And it's literally the first time that they've ever been talking. So, you know, some of these very large companies have never even been on the phone together. And I think that's a, it's a, just goes to show where we're at. Yeah, surprising, right? So uh, you've done um, a number of extraordinary things, but I would argue that one is, uh, let's talk about this one first. You know, what caused Meta to give you non-dilutive capital, like what that that is, pretty extraordinary event, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I was just with uh, a woman that used to run uh, run a large portion of Meta on the Reality Lab side uh, yesterday, and she was telling me it's very very rare for Meta to to do that. Um, typically, they actually have something called Oculus Publishing, where if they were to give a um, a percentage of of the revenue that you need in order to build an experience, they would usually take that on the on the back end as a publisher. So you know, Meta right now takes a thirty percent cut of all um, experiences sold on their store. 
So typically, if they were to give you, you know, half of the budget that you needed, they would take another 15 to 25 percent on top of that. Um, so it is very rare to, to have that happen. I think there's two things. One is that we do have a very new technology that um, is very appealing to companies like Meta and Apple because it expands their demographic. Right now, it's primarily gamers that use headsets um, anywhere between ages 13 to 20, typically male. Um, but they do have a lot of, if you, if you watch some of their, their VR headset campaigns, a lot of it is focused at, you know, the middle-aged moms, uh, that are using it to use as a social app to communicate with each other. Um, they definitely want to expand their audience. And again, they just don't have the use cases to do that. So there's, there's that, that very big side of it. Um, the other side is that Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla are, uh, specifically very focused on education. And so this immersive learning fund is tied to Meta and Reality Labs, but it's actually Mark Zuckerberg's personal fund. Um, you know, I think I think with anything, if you look at Apple's trajectory over the last 20 years, they were very, very good at getting their computers into elementary schools and high schools very early on. And so a lot of these hardware companies see that they need to be deploying and figuring out education early and kind of, you know, embedding this in the zeitgeist as, as kids are being raised, for better or worse. But you could find some really interesting use cases of, of schools in China, some of the top performing private high schools in the world, actually in China, that have completely converted to only VR education. Um, so, you know, there, it's not just a, a matter of, uh, of business, it's, it is, uh, you know, a very heightened state of learning for people. So I mentioned this to you guys before, and you probably already know it. I don't remember, but, uh, Lex Friedman's podcast, he interviewed uh, Zuckerberg once before and then just a couple of days ago. And there was a, a a lot of discussion around learning and what Zuckerberg thought about the Vision Pro release. And he had some really interesting, flattering uh, uh, things to say about the device. And of course, he talked about how it differs and how his device is uh, uh, focused on, you know, just a lower price price point, but it was all around education. How How is that meta non-dilutive capital going to be measured in whether it was successful or not? Do you guys have any feedback on that? And, and I'm getting to it, not because I want you to demonstrate that you use the money well, but how, how would, what, how they measure success in deploying that capital to you? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, the the top executive team is going to look at revenue, right? So to Lyle's point, uh, Meta still takes 30% of everything generated on our platform. And so our goal within the next 12, day, 12 months or so is to literally not only have that 400k essentially generated for Meta, but really open up to Lyle's point, a new demographic that they didn't previously see. And so uh, I'll give a use case, uh, and it's the reason why we're so excited with the Adil partnership and the Unify partnership is we have the ability to literally reach people that they haven't reached. And so let me give you an example. So there was a Miley Cyrus concert in uh, their their platform called Horizon, and it was literally a pre-recorded video, uh, and there was maybe 12 people there <laughs> in VR. Uh, and so... Uh, and then when they had their conference uh, last year, same thing, Lyle and I literally tried to go find the Mark Zuckerberg VR conference. We couldn't even find it, right? And again, it was just a pre-recorded video and we did end up finding it. So what we're basically offering them is, um, you know, really heavy duty influencers that we're working with, where we're going to create a web funnel, a traditional web funnel generate a live audience on say YouTube of tens of thousands, convert that funnel immediately um, into um, revenue um, for us and for Meta, and then have a portion of that audience go into VR. So I think where they're excited to Lyle's point is we're, we're not in the gaming audience at all. We're literally gonna have people buying headsets to use this. And that's exactly what Meta wants is they want people buying this for education. They wanna extend the demographic. And frankly, Magic Leap is excited for the exact same reason. Magic Leap sells hard hardware. That's it. Uh, they're actually rolling up their sales team for our demo to go sell for us once we launch our product. And the key there is essentially same thing. 
uh, they're excited about selling now headsets to major airlines and selling headsets to major franchising companies where we're the driving force of, of the software. So it seems odd. It was even odd to Lyle and I that these giant tech companies don't necessarily have the content creation in-house and they are looking for partners to, to accomplish these kinds of things. So that was the other extraordinary thing that struck me was the magic leap because we know how much money has been poured into that company from arguably people who know what they're doing and that, you know, all due deference to you guys, Nick and Lyle created the catalyst to, to uh, actually turn the key in what they're doing. Right. Uh, can we talk more about that? I mean, you just mentioned it, but can we go a little deeper in, in the magic leap? Cause I think it's just extraordinary. Well, I'll have you jump in. You just have to mud, you have to reference the fudgical stain. That's all. I've oh God. <laughs> oh, great. Perfect. Um, yeah. I mean, so yeah, magic leap is a very expensive hardware. They are, are solely focused on enterprise. Uh, this is the magic leap two, which is, is probably the most advanced AR headset that exists. Um, they are, uh, primarily their use cases are like construction based or hard skills based. Um, so they have it essentially, you know, we hear a lot like the digital twin when talking about AI, um, their version of a digital twin is essentially modeling somebody, you know, imagine, uh, fixing a, an airplane engine. And so there's literally a hologram of somebody doing it correctly in front of you using the same, uh, you know, model engine. And then you're essentially just mimicking that digital twin in the space. Um, so it's usually very much focused on hard skills, um, you know, things that, that people are doing with their hands typically or safety issues. Um, so, so we're really focused on the soft skill side, which um, is, is very exciting to them because it's universal. So, you know, personal professional development, um, things like training that Nick's mentioning, um, a lot of EQ building, which is really the promise of, of all immersive technology is the emotional empathy engaging side of things. So um, yes, the, the hard skills are great um, and have a lot of applications in the space, but there's just not a lot of companies thinking about the uh, emotional side. Um, and again, with us creating a social um, VR platform, emotion is at the front and center of what we do. Um, yeah, I mean, our relationship started with them about a year and a half ago. We met them at Abundance 360, which is Peter Diamandis' event, um, and immediately started talking about applications. Um, I guess I can uh, mention that. Uh, so yeah, we did. We went through the course of developing everything in VR. Um, and then as we went to be their ISV partner um, at their Magic Leap headquarters for their offsite, um, Nick was wearing a shirt from the, from the night before when we arrived. And uh, and no one else noticed, but I, I questioned him about a stain uh, after the presentation. And he let me know that he was uh, eating a fudgesicle in bed with his wife the night before. And somehow it had dripped onto his shirt. And I think it actually... Uh, I would never mention that without him prompting me, but I think it did help a little bit because most people I think are excited to find out that uh, some of the founders are, are potentially on the spectrum or so mad scientist genius that they don't even understand <laughs> their appearance <laughs> during a presentation. Um, so yeah. Or, I mean, or yeah, walk of shame, didn't care, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, again, it's, same, very similar to the relationship with Meta, we are are building use cases they've never seen before. So it's not only the expansion of their client base, but it's also the expansion of their technology and what's possible. Um, you know, even with Meta, there's things like live streaming. Uh, we're we're looking at being the first kind of ticket master or ticketing platform because they still don't have the ability to just purchase tickets directly um, from the headset. Very simple tools that. Um, we find a lot of use and need for that we're working directly with companies like Meta and Magic Leap to actually build out because it's the first time that they've even either thought about it or found a reason to build it. Um, so, you know, that's the the excitement that we get from these, these bigger companies. Is there any uh, pushback, conflict, undertone with you providing service, content, middleware to all the constituents, Meta, Apple, Magic Leap. Is there any is there any feeling that that somebody wanted exclusivity to your tech? No, uh, that's not at all. Which is quite interesting. I think uh, when we started the company, we made sure it was platform agnostic. 
simply meaning that any content we create can go on to any hardware. And I think that's, um, you know, oddly enough, to your point, Arthur, uh, I think Mark Zuckerberg's big thing about the Apple headset was, in his mind, the metaverse is a social experience. And Apple's headset was a little bit uh, lonely. It was always just someone uh, using it. And Apple used the word spatial computer and spatial computing, right? Uh, where where metaverse or meta is really focusing on sort of the social aspect of the metaverse. Um, and so I think that's really the, be, the big key differentiator between those two companies' visions uh, overall. Yeah. The, um, let's talk about the Vision Pro. What, what do you... What do you guys think of it? Is there a, is it going to legitimize the market? Did they come in at the right time? Is the price an issue? Does it really matter? Lyle and I both had tears in our eyes uh, during the Meta or the uh, Vision Pro uh, announcement. And the reason is it's sort of the promise of what spatial computing can be. And so the way I always put this is I believe XR or extended reality, augmented virtual is one of the more human ways to interact with technology. So right now we're looking at 2D screens and it's not immersive at all. And so the, the benefit of being a human being is we have audio, visual and kinesthetic prompts. And I think the most exciting thing for, for me is Apple, for anybody that's used the, the Apple Vision Pro, they're saying it feels like you have superpowers. It feels like you're, you're engaging in telekinesis because basically when you look at something, uh, that's where the the prompt goes. That's where the cursor goes. And they have patents already on it where the Apple headset will know that you're wanting to click prior to you clicking. So you'll be able to use, you know, go through menus before even making a physiological response because it'll know that you're wanting to make that response. And I think that's the benefit of where all of this is going. It's also the fear uh, of where all of this is going is the manipulation potential is off the charts but the comprehension potential is also off the charts. So you can use that same technology now to say, um, we know when someone's happy, we know when they're sad, we know we're in their state of comprehension. Uh, if we're teaching them something in real time, we'll be able to adjust it. And my belief is in five, six, seven, 10 years, whenever it might be, you'll have, you'll have kids that are 12 years old that have a GED level education because of immersive technology, because of personalized learning. And this is really, in my opinion, where everything gets turned on its head. And companies like us have the potential to be at the forefront of this and say, hey, we have a great use case on how this can be used. And you notice even Apple, they came out with the standard Apple apps, but they're going to be consciously you know, uh, looking and curating companies that have a use case in education. And we're one of those few companies right now uh, with Meta. We're one of the few companies with Magic Leap. And we're absolutely hoping to be one of the few companies with the Apple headset as well and poured an experience over there to show consumers, hey, this is where education's going. You can now be in the middle of the Sahara Desert with a headset and a Starlink Wi-Fi, and you get the same education as someone at Stanford or Harvard. I mean, this is turning education on its head without a doubt. And so I think that's that's why we're excited. Belial, jump in. Yeah, I mean, I would say a much better education than Stanford or Harvard. I mean, bless, bless those Ivy Leagues. I was literally with a bunch of Stanford professors yesterday here in San Francisco. But, you know, the lecture hall model has been broken for a very, very, very long time. Um, I would say, you know, one of the bigger things around just adoption, I think that a lot of people aren't thinking about is Apple's ability to uh, deploy demos at scale. And uh, mixed reality headsets really need to be worn for people to see the magic. Um, it's very, very hard to convey the magic of what this technology is is doing at a, even a, a very small scale, um, unless you put it on. You know, watching a, uh, using a 2D screen to advertise a 3D experience is is very difficult. And so, you know, Apple with their thousand plus stores is going to have, I imagine, very sophisticated. I, I almost I could think about it. I think when these headsets launch, you're probably going to have to, you know, check in for a wait list of potentially days to even try on a headset. Um, and you'll they'll have large kiosks with multiple headsets, and that's just going to is going to make them sell. Um, you know, Meta doesn't have that that capability. They don't have a, a boots on the ground location at all um, to to facilitate that. 
Um, I know a lot of, of people personally that have known about this industry because they've known me for, for many years and they've never been interested and never even worn a headset and they've already pre-ordered Apple's uh, headset. So I think it is going to be a huge game changer. And then Arthur, just to your, your point, um, asking about exclusivity with platforms, Nick did mention um, that we are platform agnostic, but I will say that right now the industry is new enough to where an Apple might change this, but right now Meta, Magic Leap, HTC, Pico, which is owned by, by TikTok, um, it's also new that they do not want to get into the space of exclusivity because um, they don't want to block any creators from their platform. Um, they want to create as much of an open ecosystem as possible because it, it is just too early on for them to, to, to pick and choose. They need to have their, their gates open. Um, a part of what we're fundraising for is actually to be able to port to these other headsets. So, um, you know, Magic Leap and, and uh, Meta are the things that we're, we're on and working on now. But there is outside of Apple, um, Pico is, is the largest um, headset um, side by side next to Meta. Um, and it is a large Chinese company, but they also have hu a huge division in Europe and they just expanded to the U.S. And again, it's it's very interesting that it's TikTok owned. So the two biggest headsets are the two biggest social media platforms, just to show you kind of where the technology is now. And, that, of, yeah. and of course, it will be going into gaming and will be, you know, Sony also, um, Sony PlayStation VR 2 just came out. They're also a very big player, but they're really the only game company that's in the space right now. And, and that's going to change very quickly. Um, there's probably another five to 10 large VR headset or AR headset companies in Asia um, that we have deep connections with because my, my the publishing company that I founded, Andromeda, that's actually really the specialty of the company is to take uh, American or uh, European based content and help them port and distribute to Asia. So we have a lot of deep connections there, but it's just a matter of of having the funds to be able to, um, you know, port these these um, our software into these other pieces of hardware. Um, so just wanted to mention that. Yes, we're talking about the big companies, but Asia has been hot on uh, VR AR technology long before the U.S. And they do have some very well established companies like iQiyi, um, which is you know kind of the Netflix of China, um, as well as a few others, um, Huawei. Um, other very large companies that have their own hardware. Is is Microsoft conspicuously absent in the hardware VR headset? Uh, they are now. Uh, they they were too early, uh, and so this was those. You know, they were about seven years early. Uh, if you're seven years early, you're 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 too early. You know, if you're two years early, you're a genius. Um, so right now, Meta or excuse me, Microsoft is fully invested in the AI side. So they were the primary investment uh, of Open AI. AI. Yeah, yeah. And um, what's fascinating, though, Bill Gates said the the biggest industry and the first industry to be disrupted, he believes, by all of this, is education. Yeah. So um, we got a bunch of questions, but let's take one. What are some, if any, of the use cases Genius X is contemplating in sports and athletics? Yeah, I mean, I could I could answer that. I mean, being that, so it's really important for people to know that we are a custom development studio, which is, you know, we kind of have we're we're at the two sides of the coin. We do have the publishing and the distribution uh, side of things, and and really the the creation, but. The custom development means that we're able to build, you know, on the enterprise side, we're able to build use cases specifically for companies. Um, actually, it's the the big thing that we've we've around sports that I'm just thinking of is that we've started to get connected to the Players Association of the NFL, um, and we also created a full demo for the Colts, where we actually built out the entirety of the Colts stadium in VR, um, and they went into their their season. We started talking to them on their off season. Uh, this is probably a, a really great time for us to to rekindle that. But we did have a lot of interest from athletic clubs like the NFL, uh, specifically around not only like the very, um, you know, practical side of injury, recovery, uh, maintenance, um, those types of things that, that specifically athletes need. But then on the flip side, very much uh, things that you may not think about, like um, financial literacy um, and, and how to manage their money properly. Um, things like breath work and how to calm down in between plays. Um, so there was, we have a, a catalog of experiences that were really enticing for them and essentially the site license. Again, it comes down to funding to actually have a sales team to be able to deploy some of these things, but we did have enough interest from the, the GM of the Colts to actually want to build out a demo for them uh, 
before they went into their season last year. So again, as a custom development studio, uh, we are capable of bringing in um, influential athletes into our consumer platform as well um, and look at how that how that works, you know, whether it's, um, you know, building out specific mechanics that that represent uh, sports training or if it's a matter of, uh, you know, an example like the NFL where it's actually being deployed to athletes where they're teaching uh, where we're teaching them skills from other coaches that, uh, you know, would, would help them in their career. So, so we can get into uh, it directly from people who are interested. You can speak to them offline, but can we talk a little bit about use of funds presently? I know you mentioned being able to connect with all the devices. What else would you be doing with this raise? Yeah, use of funds is a big one. So uh, uh, our whole seed round, we're in our series seed. And so I can kind of get into the specifics of where we started there. But we started with a series seed one, which was a $500,000 raise, which essentially got some of the baseline infrastructure completed. We were able to do our hiring rounds. Uh, we then did a series seed two, which was $1.26 at a $20 million market cap. So we doubled the market cap. Uh, within a very short period of time, eight months, which was, um, there's a lot of competitors that are way ahead of us with even less revenue. We were actually able to sell courses. So we actually sold courses to course creators for 35 to 50,000. So last year we had about a 350,000 uh, in revenue prior to even launching the product. And then we got the $400,000 grant from Meta, uh, which is rather unheard of for a tech company to generate any revenue in its first uh, 18 months. Uh, and that was our series seed two. So that was 1.26 million again at a 20 million market cap. We then doubled it again. So we're at a 40 million market cap. Um, and we've gotten in another 1.26 uh, as part of that. And um, essentially, uh, we're, we're looking to raise eight. And so what we realized it took about two and a half, three million to create this platform, create demos. We're now at a point that to Lyle's point, we need a port to Apple, we need a port to Magic Leap. We're creating a pilot program for Magic Leap and we really need to scale our engineering team uh, and really start having a, a marketing funnel. So that's where a deal comes in is going, okay, now how do we utilize what we've built and actually start generating revenue and marketing to actually sell these courses? So we got everything to the point of launched and now the primary uh, funds are basically, um, that gives us about three, three and a half years of burn to really go, okay, let's get into a profitability cycle now. Uh, at that point, we'll decide if we want to do a Series A. Um, and our goal is to reach a, a market cap of about 200 million within the next 18 to 24 months, um, and and kind of kind of go from there. Only to the only to the extent that you can talk about it. What does Magic Leaps? agreement do for you in terms of revenue? Magic Leap could represent upwards of 60% plus, um, Lyle will say even potentially 80% plus of our revenue. Um, we might be very much underselling the Magic Leap partnership. Uh, and I think the key here is to really understand that once we have a pilot done, Magic Leap will be using their own salespeople to directly sell our product. And so uh, if you amortize some of this, so Magic Leap has said, uh, Hawaiian Airlines as an example, or uh, one of the big investors of Magic Leap, which actually took over majority control, was the UAE, and they invested uh, 500 million plus. Magic Leap has raised 3.5 billion in the last few years to really facilitate this. Um, and basically these pilots are anywhere from uh, 150 to 200,000 for these companies. Um, and basically they said a fully fleshed out training program could cost upwards of 750,000. So what we would do is essentially amortize that over five years. So we have an, uh, an ARR, which is, is what, uh, most tech companies are valued on is the annual recurring revenue. Um, and we're, we're basing this just off of four or five clients, uh, within the next 12 months. But if we're able to really get the momentum going and hit, say, a Massage Envy or some big franchise system, you know, that number could be exponential. So uh, the enterprise side could generate five to 10 million plus in revenue. And our current burn is about 1.8 to 2 million a year. 
Uh, so if we get that side of this going, obviously we started in the consumer market first, we have that tech stack, and now it's about pushing some of that with personalized AI into the uh, corporate side. It, it could be pretty exponential, but if you're if you're looking at our projections as our, in our business plan, we're pegging one and a half to two million in the consumer vertical and one and a half to two million in the enterprise vertical within the next twelve months. But that enterprise vertical could be could be conservative. Yeah, sounds like it could be conservative. Yeah, Ted should just adopt the whole thing as a customer. Yeah. Um, I think I did. You said Ted? Arthur? Yeah, Ted, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so super interesting. All right, we're running up against time here, but this has been super helpful. We're going to do it again. Would you guys mind doing this again soon? Of course, we'll yeah. be uh, free of stains and any bad jokes, and we're <laughs> ready to go. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, we like bad jokes in state, so it's totally cool. Uh, Dill, good to see you, man. I miss you. Um, yeah. The uh, 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 recording of this, like I said, if we can post it wherever on your website, it'd be better. So we drive people to you, and then we'll make sure everybody who's on the uh, RSVP gets in touch, and then we'll schedule another one. Super interesting. And uh, Adil is, by the way, I, I don't even want to quote the number, but it's in the hundreds of millions of people who have connected through Unify. It's absolutely insane what he's done there. And he's, uh, um, uh, I, I shouldn't, he's, he doesn't tout that. So it's really powerful stuff. Um, so uh, good for you, man. So thanks again, guys. And thank you everybody for joining today. And as I always say, Thank you for sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Till next time, we'll look forward to it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.